we treat networking events completely different from how we live our lives. We go in with our life like, hey, I want to go enjoy. Maybe I'll go to a nice dinner. But we go into these events, like you said, with this kind of self-centered attitude of what am I going to get out of this? And so when people hear you ask, what do you do? They hear the tagline in their head of for me, because that's why they, why they feel like they're asking. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. On this episode, I got Brian Galke. He is a facial analysis expert. He reads faces. So he's an introverted extrovert, I guess you could call him. Uh, he purposely chose professions where people used to come to him for help, like retail, hospitality, uh, in order to help he ease his social anxiety. And over the course of his career, he realized he loved to learn new tips and tricks to better interact with people. And he always sought out the knowledge. And with every new social skill that he learned, another promotion soon followed. And he was onto something that maybe success starts with good communication skills. And the number one skill that changed his personal pro professional life forever was learning facial feature analysis. That skill alone led to Brian going from working at help desk to regional vice president of sales and not too bad for someone who still considers himself to be a bit of an introvert. And this episode, we go over how you could become an expert at reading faces yourself. We even analyze my own face. You're not going to want to miss this one. Check it out. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for being here. I, I don't know if I should cover my face when I talk to you. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you're analyzing me right now. I, I don't, no, I don't know I how to really it. proceed here. <laughs> I already analyzed you. That's the best part. That's what uh, changed me. Yeah. Fair. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. But look, I got to ask you, like, you'll tell everyone what you do, but I, I'm going to start with this. Like, how does someone get into this? Like, how, how do you, how do you get involved? In it? it was one of those circumstance things. Mm -hmm. I actually had a friend who was coming in town from, uh, for a trade show. She said, hey, while I'm in town, let's do dinner. I said, absolutely, let's do it. I got to the restaurant. She said, I'm not coming. I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, I was, I was being pissy. And she said, no, you have to come over to the trade show. You have to meet this guy, Matt. You know, no, I already sat down. I had my glass of wine. I'm good. Peace out. And she's like, no, you really need to come meet this guy. And I went over there and his name's Matt Fulfer. He's my mentor. And they're like, well, this guy can analyze faces. I'm like, whatever. I've got books over here full of body language, NLP, you name it. There's, I've never heard this before. This guy's full of it. And he broke down eight different people. And I was waiting for these generic, generic Barnum statements like, oh, you've had a hard time in life or, you know, you, you've dealt with grief. I'm like, well, who hasn't, right? Like, like, the, like the mentalist type. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like the mentalist or where you read a horoscope where it's so generic that yeah, everybody yeah. goes, yeah, that's kind of me. And so I was just waiting the whole time. I was going to bust this guy, right? And I couldn't find anything wrong with it. And so I was immediately hooked. I bought his book. I started driving. I live in Dallas, Texas. I would drive to Fort Worth 45 minutes away twice a month to go spend an hour with this guy and learn from him. And at the time I was on the help desk and it helped me go from help desk to regional vice president of sales all by learning on how to focus on other people and not myself. Changed my life. And now I teach it to other people because I'm an introvert by nature. And this is what helped me go from being an introvert to being an ambivert where I can be out in public and not have to go sit in the corner, which if you don't know what that's like, that's like being in the prison of your own mind, but in a mm. public place. So that's why I want to teach everybody today. That's amazing. I'm, I'm excited to learn it. And, and I, I like the fact that you said that because I think a lot of people like, They'll look at you. You speak on stages. You're out there. And I get the same thing. I get this podcast. I speak on stages. I know you were just at Traffic Conversion. I spoke, I spoke there last year as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you, you look at it and everyone assumes that we're extroverts. And it's for me, it's almost like a character I have to jump into because my, my default is actually an introvert. 100%. Like, like I, I think that's really my default. And I think I try really hard to be an extrovert and I analyze mm -hmm. the situation a little bit and then I go out there and then I feel more comfortable in my domain. So I mean, how has this helped you, you know, kind of be able to be comfortable going on stages, speaking in public, speaking to people? How Absolutely. has this played a role in your life? If you've ever read the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, what he oh. talked about is the people who went through these atrocious situations are when they learn to focus on other people. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my husband again. I want to see my parents. I want to see my kids. When you learn to focus on other people and you don't make yourself the focus, that's what really will change your life. And that's what, for me, how this worked out was when I was learning to start analyzing other people's faces, I got out of the prison of my own mind and into the present moment. And that's where things really changed for me because I wasn't thinking about me. It wasn't self-centered. It was thinking about how can I create a connection or a bond with this other person by speaking their language and what does their face tell me about them so that I can accomplish that. 
So how is it different from, let's say, body language and and like the NLP? Like, how does this differentiate? You, know, you read all these books about body language. And and I, I used to like study a lot of poker books because I like the body language and the tell signs. Oh, yeah. Joe Navarro's how, books. How, how does this like play a role? How How is this different? All those things are reactive. Analyzing faces can be proactive or reactive if you're there at the moment. So, for example, I'm going to show in a few minutes how I just went and found your picture on LinkedIn. And all I did was I had to look at your face and think, okay, what does this say about it? What does this say about it? And then I feel like I'm meeting up with a friend versus cold calling somebody. You and I have never met other than we talked on DMs, right? And then we looked here, but by, when I go and find pictures of you, I can try to understand you a little bit more. And then I can change my approach there to where I'm speaking your language. Or I feel like I'm, again, meeting with somebody new instead of just a cold calling someone. So before I even let you like walk through, I, I know I know you have some stuff prepared, like, Sure. Who is this? Let's let's preface this. Who is this for, and who benefits from this the most? That's going to be an early on slide, and uh, anybody can benefit from it. So, how do I use it personally? I'm an introvert, so when I I used to go out, and even though I was amongst the crowd, I felt alone in the crowd because I'd want to go up and talk to somebody, but again, I was stuck in my own head. So, on a personal side, it's just enhancing relationships that you already have, or even if you get to meet somebody new. So. Take, for example, a networking event. What do most people do? They walk up and they think, oh, what do you do? Which is what mm. the question most people hate. And I highly advise against not doing that because if somebody hates their job and you just ask them about it, they kind of hate you subconsciously. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so this is a new way to just interact with people. And uh, a tip totally not related to analyzing faces, but is when I meet somebody, I'll go, hey, you know, now that we can travel again, uh, where's the next place you're going to go on vacation? Because people show up to work, but people plan their vacation. And you'll learn more about somebody by asking them about where they go for vacation than what they do for a living. So little things like that. Which is funny because I feel like the biggest mistake people make at networking events is they become transactional. What does this 100%. person, what can this person do for my business right now? Like, how do I, how do I complete a transaction right here? And we all know that that's not the way real life works. Not at all. You don't just walk in and walk to the register, right? Like you look, browse around the store, you shop, you look at things. It, we treat networking events completely different from how we live our lives. We go in with our life like, hey, I want to go enjoy. Maybe I'll go to a nice dinner. But we go into these events, like you said, with this kind of self-centered attitude of what am I going to get out of this? And so when people hear you ask, what do you do? They hear the tagline of their head of for me, because that's what they, mm -hmm. why they feel like they're asking. We don't feel like people want to know about us, but they want to know or the other people that we ask, we're thinking, what can they do for me? That's why I like to completely change the question or, hey, look, I'm almost up in Audible or I'm almost done with my new book. What's one you recommend? That tells me way more about somebody and it lets them share an experience, not just a, a job title. And so what what became the the driving force, the passion, I guess, for you? Of, of I know you're you're big and you want this to be taught in schools. And right. I, I'm, a, I'm a person who thinks financial literacy should be taught in schools. And, oh, and 100%. Where, What's, what's the reason behind your big push of why this should be taught in all schools? Because I know how horrible it is to feel stuck in a moment and not know what to do and stuck in the prison of your own mind. I know I keep going back to that, but literally is where I am. But I also have a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I saw that most parents are so busy doing this now, they're not paying attention to kids. And I see them struggle. Look, I'm, I'm 47. But kids younger than me, and I say kids, in my head I am a kid. <laughs> but People have grown up with the ability to perfect the picture, have the perfect text message, the perfect email. What most people's fear of being up on public stage is what a face-to-face -face conversation is today for people. So I want to help people just remember how to interact with each other without having to go through a device or a screen. And I realize it's ironic because we're doing this over Zoom, but this is how we can impact more people, right? So you have a five-year-old, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. What do you hope that your five-year-old learns from, from what you're doing right now? The ability to walk out and make friends and to go and talk to people and have those legitimate conversations. That's how we all got to know people. You know, you used to go out, you'd find commonality in an event and you talk to people instead of just through your screen. And for her in particular, right now, she grew up, um, and like you said, your kids are around the same thing, where teachers, you couldn't read their lips. So I know that some of her her growth is stunted because we're natural lip readers. That's why when we watch movies, 
we have a hard time when the audio is different from the mouth moving, right? Ooh, yeah. And so if you think about it, that's how kids have learned the last few years wow. is they can't read lips and repeat things because the lips were hidden. And so I know that we're going to have to make up for time where we had to keep people safe. I love that analogy. I love that comparison. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, I, we, we could dive in. I'll, I'll let you start and, and I'm sure, sure I have questions along the way, but, uh, but like, let's, let's learn. Let, 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 yeah. let us get taught. Uh, so I do have one question I should ask this early on. Sure. Is this strictly a video or will people be listening to it auditory as well? Both. Both. All right. So I'll be more descriptive when we're describing some of the slides here. Yeah. Um, so what I want to teach everybody today is what I call an unfair advantage. The reason why I named the company Subtle Skills is because you don't have to tell anybody that you're doing this at all. But the advantage is it's how to build rapport instantly with people, right? Learn how to talk to people, overcome shyness, and then keep you in the present moment. And this will make a lot more sense in a minute. But when you're talking to people this day and age, the challenge is people aren't paying attention because you're not paying attention to them. Most people are so concerned with their own message and themselves, and people can feel that. People know when you're genuinely trying to create a connection with them or when you're doing a canned speech or something you've rehearsed before. So the picture up on the screen for people who are listening is when you're focused on you and everybody else is blurred out, well, then they're distracted and they're on their phones as well. What changed the world for me was learning to analyze faces is I do think body language is important. I'm going to cover that in a minute. But when I'm paying attention to your body, I'm not paying attention to you. And the, the number one question I get asked all the time is, is this like the show lie to me? I think that's an awesome show, but that again is waiting for a reactive skill, a, a type of movement in their face. I'm, when I'm talking to someone and I'm analyzing their face, I'm giving them my full time and attention, which is so rare this day and age that it instantly creates connection with people. So I tell people, get out their phones, take a picture of their own face, because when they do this, when we're talking about things, you can kind of look at your own face while you're doing it. And then later on, I'll put the QR code back up. So don't worry about that for now. And I'll, and I'll put the link to, to wherever you need in the show notes as well. So Sure. Perfect. So then the whole funny thing about it is we've all been taught on how to analyze people or read faces because it's part of our everyday language. And the reason for that is authors and artists used to go and take courses in what's known as physiognomy, which is how to understand facial features and what it tells us about people. So then we start using as part of our everyday language. We say, hey, it's written on their face. If I say keep a stiff upper lip, that means don't share your emotions. So when you see somebody who has a flatter upper lip, you know they don't like ask, being asked a lot of personal questions immediately. So we use these phrases all the time. We say take one on the chin. That's how we handle adversity. When we say keep your nose to the grindstone, it literally people who have smaller noses and they can do redundant tasks over and over and over again. So I know it's kind of crazy, but we've all been trained by it and not just because we've heard these phrases, but if you think about every book you ever had to read in school, before we could put pictures or photographs of what we wanted the characters to be, we had to read about them. And the only two ways for the author to describe the characters was through their facial features and through their actions. Or, because we talked about having kids, if you turn on a Disney movie, you know immediately who's the hero and who's the villain based on their facial features. So we've been trained our entire life. You've never just been formally trained. Making sense so far? Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it just goes so deep, it's unbelievable. So what's it known as? It's basically called physiognomy and is the muscles. There's 42 muscles in the face and they can adjust over time. So the mind creates movement, movement creates muscle. I'm gonna show you pictures here in a few minutes of my own face with a 20 year difference and how much has changed between now and then. But this is what it's based on. And it's been around since the Greeks. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. This actually used to be taught in schools. But then when something known as phrenology, which was bumps on the head, was supposed to determine your character. If you had a bump over here, it said, oh, you're a criminal. Let's put you in jail. Well, you can't. It's not at all what reading faces or analyzing faces is trying to do. We're just trying to teach you how to understand other people, not judge other people. So why should people listen to this? Why should you learn it? I don't know, you like free upgrades and hotels, airfare? Like I use it all the time. You know why? Because I talk to people that other people don't pay attention to. So right now there's a big challenge. Hey, go to Starbucks, buy the next person lines coffee. What about if you just treat the barista like a person? Then what happens is every other person they interact with ends up getting better treatment as a result. So I'll tell you a quick story. I was at a wedding in, um, Jekyll Island, which is on the Florida Georgia line. 
and the server came over and he had a name tag on that said he was um, Bulg or, sorry, Hungarian. I'm like, okay, well, I've been to Budapest and everywhere I go, I now learn basic phrases. Please, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, thank you. So he came over and filled up my wine glass and I said, Kosanom. He goes, oh, you speak Hungarian. I said, well, I've been there. So, you know, I try and just want to say thank you in your own language. Well, guess whose glass was never empty the rest of the day? Not just mine, but everybody at my table benefited as well because I treated him like a person. So when you start doing this and you start talking to people and you make them feel seen and heard, you'll benefit in tremendous ways. And even if you don't get upgrades, you make the other person feel better and it changes the dynamic for everything. But literally I've got an upgrade on uh, airplanes, hotels. Um, if you wanna tell people what you're doing, you wanna test this out. I end up getting free food and drinks at places I go. Cause they're like, okay, bring over somebody else. So you get like a mini celebrity status. But again, yep. it's only if you want to tell them what you're doing. Makes sense? Yep. All right. I've got multiple monitors here. I just want to be able to move so I can see your face also. Um, but really the best thing about it is just treating people differently and people feeling seen and heard makes all the impact in the world. And it's, it's just, there's nothing that has a downside to it. So the number one people or question people ask is, well, what about genetics? And absolutely what you inherit is your genetic code, right? So you're born, you kind of look alike, but what you experience during life is known as epigenetics. So I like to show the picture here of the bodybuilder guy who only does upper body and has never done legs mm -hmm. in his life. Well, you wouldn't say that's genetic. That's what muscles he chose to move and which ones he didn't. And our faces are no different because there's 42 muscles in the face. Well, as we keep making those faces over and over again, our face actually alters over time. So when we were kids and our parents said, quit making that face, it'll get stuck that way. Yep. There's a little bit of truth to it. So uh, like I said, if, because as soon as people find out what I do, they start going, oh crap, okay, that's great. <laughs> you know, and you said it earlier, yep. like I don't even want to look at my face. So what do I do? I show my own face first to people. And what's crazy on this is, can you see my cursor if I move it over here? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to look away for a minute because I do have a monitor that we're looking at here. But if you look at the differences, this is me at 18 versus 38. So if you look at my eyebrow here on this side, it used to be straight and now it's angled. That actually happened over time when I became a corporate trainer. Well, an angled eyebrow, and we're gonna cover this in more depth in a second, is what's my angle? Help me understand it so I can help other people. When I became a corporate trainer, that's when my eyebrows started to do like this for an angle. So I didn't go and get it threaded or blended or whatever it is that people do with their eyebrows. That's how the muscles have changed over time. You can also look, my ears are closer to my head. Uh, my eyes used to angle down. I was raised in a very loving home but it was one of the homes that we could always think about what could go wrong, what's the potential downside of things. And my eyes actually used to angle down. Over time, they equaled back up as I got into more personal development, learned the things I loved. So you can see all these changes in my face. I mean, I also used to have badass hair and now I have none. So, you know, that has nothing to do with faces, but you get to see how do people change over time, right? Now, why is it so beneficial today? A lot of people have been in their houses for the last two years and they forgot how to interact with other people. It used to be that we sat on our front porches and we interacted with neighbors and everything else. I'm going way back, not just even the last two or three years, but people now basically get everything delivered to their house and their human contact has gone down even more and more with Zoom and everything else. Add to that, with Zoom, you can't read body language, right? Are my arms crossed? Are they not? Are my legs crossed? You don't know. But that's where we are right now as a society is we very rarely go out like we used to for, to get a lot of social interaction with other people. And like we mentioned before, you know, if you go somewhere that you still have to wear a mask, well, if you're sarcastic like I am and I make a sarcastic comment, you can't tell if I'm smiling after it or not. But even with this much of my face hidden, you can still tell a lot about people. And this is what I'm gonna teach today is how to understand the eyebrow height, eyebrow shape, eye angle will still tell you a lot about somebody else. So still on track? Love it. Okay. All right. So you asked earlier, what makes this different? This is the number one benefit. And that is I can do it proactively. So as soon as I know I'm going to meet with someone, I can go to LinkedIn, I can go to social media, I can go to their company's website, the about us, find pictures and start figuring out how should I best interact with them? So for example, 
if somebody has large eyes and smaller ears, they tend to be more visual. So I'll send them an email or I'll send them a text. If it's somebody who has larger ears and smaller eyes, and it's in proportion to their face, because obviously everybody's ears are larger than their eyes, but it's in proportion. Then if they have larger ears, then I'll leave them a voice text or I'll give them a phone call. And I'm going to show you examples of this in a minute. Now, but now, just a question on that is, does it sure. go as far as, as also the type of language you have to use with them versus? Not, well, yes and no. So when I'm talking to someone, if they have larger eyes, I'll say things like, can you see where I'm coming from? Picture this. That's, that's what I meant. Yes. Like your, your, your language, the way you, the, the way you communicate with them or get them to feel something or get them to experience something changes, right? Based on. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you'll see, I'll actually have a slide in the end that says not is it just who you're talking to, but if you're doing a presentation and it's going to be sent off to the entire corporation, I add in universal language. So I'll add auditory, visual, and kinesthetic because you don't know who the next recipient is, right? So that's more on the sales side if you're doing presentations. Um, we didn't mention body language. These are two of my favorite books on body language, and that is What Everybody is Saying by Joe Navarro. Very picturesque book. I think it's fantastic. It teaches you how to read a room. And then Janine Driver's book on the right, which is the yellow book, it's You Say More Than You Think. That's a fantastic book for everybody right now because it's about looking at your own body language. Because again, we've been sitting inside houses for a long time or doing things over Zoom that we've forgotten to pay attention to how we are presenting ourselves to people. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. What's the problem with body language right now? Because the world has changed, we're doing a lot more over the phone, over Zoom. Or even if you're able to get into a room, people have their laptops open and so they're hiding a majority of their body. So again, learn those skills for when you can see someone's body. But a lot of times you're, it's kind of hidden from you. You can't always do it. But an even bigger reason is if you look at the screen, would you rather talk to somebody who's reading your face and looking at you eye to eye or looking down at your body language? So if I did the entire Zoom meeting like this, people would be like, what's wrong with that guy? And I don't know if you've ever seen this, there are people who do Zoom meetings like this because there are other computers over here and people <laughs> feel like it's yeah. dismissive versus yeah. you and I are facing each other. And it's crazy to me, but that's how body language works. I do pay attention to body language, but I'm not looking down. It's more peripherally paying attention to people's body language, you know, but when you're analyzing their face, you get credit for staring at their eyebrows like you're making eye contact at the exact same time. It, I'm telling you, it's a game changer. This was the first book I was ever given when I got into sales, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's a great book, but it told you, hey, go into somebody's office, see what's going on. What can you see in their background? Well, now most people work from home. So what do they have? They have a fake background like I have. You can't see what's in my actual house, right? Or if you go into somebody's office, they a lot of times have to be sanitized now. You're not allowed to put up a lot of personal things like you could before. So it's still a great book to read to understand people, but you're very challenged in what you can seek, right? And we're doing more over phone, email, Zoom, but that's where social media kind of comes in. So as long as you're looking for pictures, see what they enjoy doing, right? Are they out? Are they a foodie? Do they like going to on vacations? A lot of picture beaches. You can learn a lot more from people's social media than actually going to their offices anymore. Talked about how can you see this in other people? Have you ever seen this show, The Voice? Of course. Okay, so if you know anything about them, in the show, they start like this, and if they like what they hear, then they turn around to see what the person looks like. Now, while some people are like, oh, hey, I know these are celebrities, the first thing I know is, why are they perfect people to be on the show? Well, if you look, very large ears and very small eyes. Mm. So when you're looking at that, that's, these are very auditory people, so they're perfect for the role of being a judge on this show and then these are people that I would call or send a voice text or a video text before a normal text message or an email. Make sense? Yeah. So for everybody who's listening in, if you look on uh, or if you watch the show, The Voice, you're going to see people with very large ears and very small eyes. So now, how can you use this proactively? I just went right before we got on here and stalked Jason on his LinkedIn profile. And there we go. <laughs> yeah. So the thing that the challenge with LinkedIn is you don't know how recent is their photo, but 
that's the one that's usually in the most present, uh, professional, the most well-lit, you name it. But again, it could be old. If anybody's seen somebody like realtors, LinkedIn profiles, <laughs> yeah. I swear sometimes they're like from 85 years ago. <laughs> so start with LinkedIn, then I move on to other social media. But for the people who are watching right now, what does Jason have? He's got a brow ridge here. So what is that? A brow ridge is people who like processes. Step one, step two, step three, step four. He's got low eyebrows that they're close to his eye. This will make more sense in a minute because we're going to cover this, but I know he understands things very fast. So I don't have to give him a lot of time when I'm explaining something new. He's got a Cupid's bow. So people listen to you when you talk because it's like a subconscious arrow that says, listen to me. You do have a little bit of a flatter upper lip. So I know you're not going to talk about yourself first. I'm going to wait and pay and until you start talking about yourself, then I'm going to ask personal questions. But if I came out immediately out of the gate, asking you a lot of personal questions, you're going to be like, oh, okay. That's a little too wow. much too quick, right? Yeah. Uh, recessed eyes, I have the same thing. That's somebody who's always paying attention to what's going on, even when people think you aren't. And then a good yeah, Tyler, we'll, we'll record that one part just for my wife. We'll send her <laughs> yeah. just that, that one part where she's always like, you're not even listening to me. I'm like, and I repeat verbatim everything she said to me. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm, she's like, how'd you do that? I'm like, because I'm listening. Because I am. And that's what the people, if it's, they're extremely visual, they think you have to be looking directly at them to be paying attention. Like, no, I can still be paying attention to a lot at the same time. And then you have a, a rounded chin here. So that is you stand up for adversity and criticism for the people you care about. That's the rounded part here. So with that, people always ask, oh, my God, how long did it take to learn this? Look, you guys are going to leave today with understanding the very, very basic but life changing part of understand people based on their eyebrows. And what you do is you just test little things and keep adding to it. Where did I start? I started with 12 years ago. I met my mentor, Matt. I bought, uh, I guess the book won't show now. That's the only downside. Ah, oh, crap. Anyway, it's called Amazing Face Reading. That was his book. I still carry it around with me today so that I show people where I started from. Because can I do it instantly? Yes. Do I use it all the time? No. Can it be learned by anybody? It absolutely can. And again, the best part about it is you don't have to tell anybody what you're doing. And it's no different than if you pick up a body language book, you don't walk into a room and go, I just read a body language book. All right, everybody be comfortable. <laughs> you know, you get to do this in the background. I, I feel like a lot of people listening are like, okay, cool. Now, is this going to be my human lie detector test? Am I now going to ask people questions and be able to figure out like, okay, they're lying or, or, or whatnot, but, but that's not the point of all this. Right. And I don't even that's, think. No, that's, so that's more of the lie to me. That's um, micro expressions where you're looking for somebody who'll tell you something like, oh yeah, I'm absolutely there. That's, that's all reactive. This is just completely trying to understand people and how they process information. Got it. Yeah, this is strictly rapport building in order yep. to in order to whatever you want, sell more, meet more people, have more friends, whatever it is you're looking to do. So my biggest customers during the pandemic, dating advice, because everybody was going on to apps, right? And so what do you have on a, a dating app? You have a picture of somebody's face and you have wow. what they put below it. And so, for example, and I'll use this. I don't have a lot of upper eyelids. You're like, don't date that person. <laughs> yeah. There are a few. There, if yeah. you see a downturn nose, that's yeah. why when you look at vampires, witches, anything you name it in movies, they all have a downturn nose because it's sort of like blocking off their oxygen. So it's just for them. And that is when you see somebody who has a downturn nose, that's the somebody who thinks, well, you got to break a lot of omelets or eggs to make an omelet. Yeah. So more, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, but like some people, how much of that is, can you control? Can you have someone with a downturn nose who actually is a selfless person and a good person, but like just genetics gave him a downturn nose and like, like how much of this is a hundred percent accurate accuracy versus versus like, let's not totally judge. Let's kind of test and see. That's why, you know, well, first off, it's not a hundred percent. It absolutely is not. Is it high nineties? Yes. But and I give the example all the time. I used to have a roommate who was left-handed but he still wore his watch on his left hand. And well, normally if I see somebody with a watch on their right hand, I'll ask him like, oh, so you're lefty? Is this what you do? And that's that's a barometer test, I'm, right? I'm a, I'm a lefty who wears his watch on his left hand. See, there you go. So you'd be a perfect example of somebody that I would have gotten completely wrong. I would have assumed you're right-handed because most people don't want to wear the watch on the hand that it'll drag, mm. right? So same thing with, with analyzing faces, very high accuracy rate, very, very high. Now I will tell you, if I'm doing this in public in front of people. So I do this sometimes 
and like when I get done speaking, I'll stand around and everybody wants to have their face analyzed. So they'll come up and surround me. When somebody volunteers their friend who has a flatter upper lip, that person's going to say I'm 100% wrong every time. And that goes back to if you have a very flat upper lip, you don't like the idea that somebody can know you based on what you don't tell them about yourself. So I already know that's a losing situation. I'll actually write it down so I can show somebody later on. They're going to say I'm full of it, <laughs> right? But there are those features that stand out like that. But again, I don't want to judge anyone. I want to help people understand other people. So I've been approached by HR companies going, well, can we do this for hiring? And I've kind of stiffed armed them for a very long time because I never want to be the cause that somebody doesn't get a job. But I'd rather I go in for team building and team bonding on how to teach people yeah. how to understand their peers better. Make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to take a look at eyebrows now, what I call uh, just, just browsing. And that's there's three basic types of eyebrows. But people go, well, why do eyebrows matter? So I tell them, okay, go and Google, like I did here, people without eyebrows. <laughs> so if you look, these are all celebrities that you take away their eyebrows and you don't even feel like you know who they are. You know, so Nicolas Cage, look at Angelina Jolie in the picture here. Like, can you even realize that's her? Wow. No. Yeah. And I'm a huge Ryan Reynolds, Deadpool fan. Look at Ryan Reynolds. Like you don't recognize who the people are. Yeah. If you take away their eyebrows. Yeah. Kind of nuts, isn't it? Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and the other reason I teach eyebrows, there's a few different ones. I'm going to tell you my favorite one in a second, but eyebrows lead to eye contact. So if you're nervous or you don't know what to do, whatever, you literally just start by thinking, oh, hey, what shape are their eyebrows? And this is naturally going to happen. And that's when you create the connection with someone is by creating that eye contact. But I, I love them. Be, yeah. Before you even jump into how to do this, I, I want to I want to maybe add something and, and, and pick your brain is how do you do this without looking creepy like is what's this guy looking at? Like, you're not, like, I don't want people looking and going squinting and like trying to like stare at someone's eyebrow and be like, what are you looking at? Like, is something right. wrong with me? How, so how do you do this naturally? Also, I, I, I don't know if that's in the presentation, but I'd love no, it's her. not. That's a fantastic question. It's no different than when you walk up and you meet somebody. Don't you just kind of look them in the eye anyway? Like, it doesn't yeah. matter if you walk up to shake hands, you look at them. Well, what you do is you look and then you kind of look away. Right? You don't stare at the feature the whole time. Because if I did do that, if I was doing this the whole time, yeah. you know, people would get creeped out. So all I do is I think I go, okay, what shape is this eyebrow? What shape is this eyebrow? And I'll explain that here in a minute because we are all two-faced. There's two sides of our face. So depending on what you're talking to the person about, is it a personal thing or is it a business thing? It determines what eyebrow you look at. So I just say, look at the feature, then look at the eye. Then look at the feature, look at the eye. And it's just like you don't make entirely eye contact with a person the entire time that you're talking to them or else it comes off the same way. So the same way you make eye contact is how you look at a feature. Now, the closer to the eye it is, the less time you want to focus on it. But like if you're looking at somebody's ear, you can kind of look at their ear for a second. People won't pay attention to it yeah. like they will if you're doing the eyebrow the whole time. <laughs> the other thing is try and keep your like you mentioned, squinting is number one. Number two. When you're looking at somebody, don't go like this or like this, because then they know you're analyzing them, not talking to them, right? Because if I'm talking to you, I'm like, yeah, okay. You're going to start thinking, what's in my teeth or what, you know, what do I have on my face? So that's what you just kind of want to do it with your eyes. Just look at the different facial features and then kind of look away again. Does that help answer? Got it. Yeah. Um, favorite places for me to practice? Airports. You know why? Nobody's paying attention to anybody. So you can just walk through eyebrows and you just practice angled eyebrow, straight eyebrow, rounded eyebrow as you're just walking down the corridor because nobody's paying attention to anybody else in the airport. But I do like eyebrows because you can see them from far away. You can see them if people are wearing glasses or not. And if you can't see them because they're wearing glasses, it tends to be because their glasses or sunglasses actually match the type of eyes that they have. So if you look, my eyebrows sit on top of my glasses, yep. except for where I have the angled one. See, it angles up. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, why are eyebrows important? Because when we're born, if we're lucky enough to be born with sight, our eyebrows are what help keep our eyes safe. But ironically, they tell us how people filter information as well. So how do you take in information? How much time do you need when you're processing an idea? All that can be visible from somebody's eyebrows. That's why when you look at babies, all babies have large eyes and then their other features can adjust over time. Well, that's because when you're born, you're born with sight, but you don't understand sounds and you don't understand words yet. So if you look at most babies, you'll see like that large, large eyes, and then features adjust over time. Kind of crazy, huh? Yeah. 
So if you think of eyebrows like speed bumps in a road and data trying to race down your forehead to get into your eye, you can think of it, if there's a speed bump in the middle of the road, I can go only so fast, I have to go over the speed bump, then I can try and speed back up. But like you, where your eyebrow is so close to your eye, that data can race down your forehead and you only have to slow down at the very end. So when we say highbrow or lowbrow humor, highbrow humor is where somebody tells you a joke and you have to like ponder it for a second and then you laugh. And lowbrow humor is jackass or the three stooges where you see it and you instantly laugh. So this is what I, I say, it's part of our everyday language. Go and research highbrow humor and lowbrow humor. That's literally what it means. Wow. Yeah. Cool. So if you see somebody like this, who there's more than a finger width between their eyebrow and their eye, that's considered a high eyebrow. So proceed with caution. So when you're talking to them, you can give them the information, but then like the car example, once they get the information, they need time before they make a decision. So it goes slow from their eyebrow into their eye. So if you see somebody who sees and has an, a high eyebrow, these people need time to make up their mind. The biggest pet peeve is being uh, forced to make a decision. So if you're in a, sale, a selling environment, like I used to be in technology sales, if I force someone to make a fast decision, I may have gotten a sale, but I lost the customer because they're going to have buyer's remorse after the fact. So if you see that on somebody that they've got a high eyebrow, just know, okay, that, that means that they need time to make a decision. So is they it, may not buy today. Is it that they'll not buy today or you need to maybe slow down or present things in a different way for them to understand because it may not come as quick as as you give me something else. So you may need to add in more analogies. You may need to sell, you may need to provide more value or certain things like that in order to increase the likelihood of them making a decision. 100%. It's all of those different things. You just know it's not going to be an immediate yes with them. So how much time they need depends on what they're buying. Obviously, the larger the purchase, the more time they're going to need or the more information they may need. But they're just going to hate that if you want, all right, now hurry up, go make a decision. That's what they're going to dislike. Now, on the inverse of that, if you see somebody whose eyebrow is literally sitting on top of their eye, they understand things very fast. They're going to want you to get to the point fast, and they're going to make a decision faster. Now, because they understand things very fast, they have a tendency to interrupt other people. <laughs> As I've interrupted you this entire, this entire podcast, we're, 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 we're doing this. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, but it's my have, podcast. I, I'm allowed to interrupt. Low brow or high well, brow, it's mine. And nobody wants to be talked to. I'd rather have the conversation. Yeah, I'm so just messing while with I put up the slides, absolutely, yeah. let's talk. But I'll tell you, I used to get really offended when somebody interrupted me because I thought, well, they think they're just better than me. Yet, hmm. But then when I look, I go, they got a low eyebrow. They just get it. And the thing is, you want to help other people get there or understand it. So every time you've asked anything, it's been to try and help other people, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it's one of the things of, I do it too. I have a tendency to interrupt. And I, again, I used to be offended by it. Now I just know that's the way the person's wired. So that's just who they are. And that's what I mean by it's not judgment. It's about understanding people. Based I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop telling people that it's because it's my podcast. I'm allowed to interrupt and just be like, it's because I have low eyebrows. All right. That's what you should absolutely do. You should take a screenshot of this page and be like, it's, it's a low brow. It's a low brow. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, um, then you just start looking at people differently. So if you see the picture here, high eyebrow, this one, he's making a face, so you can't really pay attention to it. Low brow, kind of high, kind of, this is called a no read because it's right in the middle. Yeah. So you just start looking at people differently. So now that you understand the two heights, what you start looking at is what are the three basic shapes of eyebrows? So there's three basic shapes. There's straight, angled, and rounded. And it's kind of like we were kids and we played the game, put the right peg in the right hole. Well, when you start looking at people's eyebrows, it tells you how to talk to them. So you either get straight to the point, help them understand what's my angle, or think about the people around them. So as we go into those a little bit more, there we go. So the first one is, oh, did it go right? Yeah. Okay. The first one is a straight eyebrow. So when you see a straight eyebrow, you think get straight to the point, facts, figures, data, and stop talking. The only thing that you need to ask them, because they tend to be the people who've already done their research is what other information can I get? Because they understand things. They want to know, like if you're doing the car dealership, hey, uh, what are you looking for today? Or do you want to know how many miles per gallons? Do you want to know the interest rate? Or do you want to know the payment information? And just stop talking and let them ask questions because these people want to get straight to the point. Um, when I was married, we went to a gym one time 
And all we wanted to know was, what's the rate? And the guy kept talking, kept talking. We're just like, cool, get it. I know you have a, a script you have to read through. We're ready to sign up today. What's the monthly rate? And he wouldn't get to the point. So we got up and left. Hmm. And so when you start dealing, you can just stop and say, hey, what other information do you need? If you feel like you're losing them, this is where salespeople get it wrong. Sometimes people are like, oh, man, I had an hour long meeting. We talked the entire time. Matter of fact, we almost went over into the next meeting. Duration doesn't always equal success when you're talking to somebody. They may have quit paying attention 15 minutes in, but you were on your script and you just kept talking. Wow. Yeah. So that's where you look at the eyebrow. If you realize they've got a straight eyebrow and you've been talking for a while, stop and say, what other, what other information did you want to know and involve them in the process? Well, it's good to know I'm on the same page as Bill Gates and, uh, and Bradley, Bradley. And my boy Bradley. Oh, yeah. So yeah. If you've ever talked with Brad, if you don't get straight to the point with Brad fast. Oh, he, he has no patience. He had no patience. He's, he's, <laughs> he's done. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I love Brad. He's one of my mentors. So, um, angled eyebrow, what's their angle, help them understand it so they can help other people talked about, I got it here when I became a corporate trainer. So now when you see somebody with angled eyebrows, involve them in the process, right? Help them understand it. So using the three different pitches, when you're talking to, to the different eyebrows, straight eyebrows, get straight to the point, bottom line, what do they need to know? Angled eyebrow is help them understand how they can help their employees, their customers, you name it. Because once you involve them in the process, these are your people who will be your, be your biggest advocates. They'll leave you the testimonials. They'll give you referrals because they want to be included in the process. So is it what's your angle or what's their angle in the sense of like, if I'm selling an information, I'm selling a coaching right. program, for example, mm -hmm. and they come in, is it get them to understand my angle of why I started the coaching program? Or is it get no. them to understand the benefit for them? Them first the and the other people second. So for example, let's say you're selling a coaching program, how it's going to make them a better person so then they can help their employees, their prospects, help them understand what's in it for them. That will help other people. Don't make it all about them. But once you've gone through my coaching course and you understand these things, this is how you can help X. So what's the angle? What's the benefit? Pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah. Now to go the opposite of that is the rounded eyebrow. Rounded eyebrow people are the exact reason why you get on a plane. You have to tell people put on your own mask first and then someone else's because rounded eyebrow people think about everyone around them first and themselves second. So if you ask them or you tell them in a selling environment, how the coaching program is going to help them, they won't understand it. You have to talk about how everyone that they coach will understand it. And then you bring it back to them. So that's the complete opposite of the angled eyebrow. And I like to use these two people as an example for the people who are watching from home is Elon and Oprah, right? So he could have retired after he sold PayPal and not done anything. But what is he constantly investing in, right? Electric cars helps the environment, not just himself, trying to go to Mars, to help other people. Even PayPal was set up out of a frustration to help other people with things instead of him just focusing on himself. With Oprah, unless you've done your research, what do you know about Oprah? Not much, but you know who she interviewed and what is she given her audience? Like if I could walk into any room and say, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. And people would know it was Oprah and look at her rounded eyebrows. It's crazy, right? So now you're in a room and you're selling or you're pitching and you have three different people in there that you're pitching to. Yes. They all have different eyebrows or two of the same. Do you then have to, you have to like really craft your message when you look at one and focus on like, here's the angle for you, or here's the benefit for you. And like, I know you probably have a bunch of questions that you want to get to. Feel free to interrupt me and answer your question if they have a straight eyebrow. Do you really have to like go that detail and craft your message to each one? You make eye contact with the person you're wanting to talk to at the time. So when I used to do presentations, I was part of a group that any customer over a million dollars, me and two other people got flown out to. And depending on what I was talking about, I would look at the person and sometimes point at them when I'm doing it. Now, where do you start? Start with the highest eyebrow because they're going to need the most amount of time. Then I look around. So when I'm talking about, let's say, um, let's say I'm selling technology to make, uh, let's see, a way for people to contact each other. Let's say I'm selling Zoom, right? If I see the high eyebrow, I'm going to start talking about what Zoom is. Then if I see that they have a rounded eyebrow, the people I'm going to talk to is, oh, you know, it's going to help you connect with your loved ones. So you get to see them, you get to talk to them. If I see the angled eyebrows, 
with this tool, you're not even going to have to travel around. You're from the comfort of your own home. You're going to be able to reach out to other people and help them. And because you're not going to lose that commute time, you know, that's more customers that you can help. But again, I'm focusing on them because it's their angle first. But for the straight eyebrow person, I'm going to go, look, it's cheap. It's this much a month. You can set it up. You can have a maximum of 50 attendees in your Zoom. So imagine all the people you can bring in it from that point and, you know, go into the specifics of the cost. So when, depending on who's in the room, I know which part of the presentation, because I'm going to have all those facts anyway, but I literally look at the person when I'm talking about something that speaks their language. And how do you adapt it for when you're on stage? So <laughs> here's my little trick. I look for rounded eyebrow people when I'm on stage because I know they're there to support me. So when I'm on stage, what I'll do is I, if I get up, look, I still get nervous getting up. So what I do is I look for rounded eyebrow people first because they're the ones with the biggest smiles. And I know that they're here to support other people. And those are my people who are there to support me. Interesting. Yep. I like it. Cool. Yeah. So well, I mean, if you think about it, who would you rather pet? A bulldog or a Doberman pincher? So we look for rounded things. Yeah. But so then in your presentation, are you keeping all these things in mind that you also have people in the room who are low eyebrow? You have people in the room who are high eyebrow and you have people in the room who have angled eyebrows. Yes. So I, when I'm in here, for example, that's why the benefit statements moved up to the top of a presentation. Because if I don't hurry up and get to what's yeah. the benefit for them, they're going to quit paying attention. The other thing is if this was me up on a stage, we would have gone through these slides faster because I start pulling people out of the audience. And what I do is I start having the audience do it. So for example, I spoke at Bradley's Closer School Live in Vegas uh, a month ago. Mm -hmm. Once I got through a few of these slides, I said, y'all are enough to be dangerous now. And it was a door knocker. A lot of people who were door knockers or sell solar, right? Roofing, solar, knocking on people's doors and said, don't listen for me. I wanna show you how fast you learn this. So I started, I said, all right, I'll take five volunteers each side of the stage. You guys come up one-on-one. -on -one. I'd bring people up and I go, how high are their eyebrows? High eyebrows. What does that mean? Give them time. All right, next person. Low eyebrows. All right, what does that mean? Get to the point fast. Start showing people how fast that it works. And of course, the other people, I, I'm for the straight eyebrows. All right, and you'll have my QR code at the end so you can download the cheat sheet and you can sign up for the course if you want to. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we'll use you as a perfect example. Actually, you, you accidentally led me into the right slide. Hmm. So now you've seen enough of this. So with her, what type of eyebrows does she have? Round. What does that mean? That means she needs more time. Yep. Now what about the guy here? Low eyebrow, like me. Yeah. Straight, quick to the point. Right. Okay. Now, what about her? Angled eyebrow. On which side? She's got one of each, right? So on, her, on my left, her right. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then a low one on the other one. Exactly. So that's because we actually are two faced and we have two sides of our face. We have a personal side and we have a professional side. The easiest way to remember is if I ask you, Hey, are you married? That's a personal question and a wedding ring goes on the left hand. So when you're looking at somebody, the left side of their face is their, how they make personal decisions and they're personal. And this is the professional side. So going back to her on her professional side, it's angled. But on her home side, it's straight. And we can be a different person at home as at work. And so that means they just have no patience at home and they need to be like, they're, they're, <laughs> they're short at home. And then it's like, yes. I feel like anyone with kids is eventually going to lower their eyebrows. <laughs> well, that's if you don't pull them out, right? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so when you start looking at people, you start thinking, okay, this is the personal side of their face over here. This is the professional side. Need another way to think about it is if you call it personal, Personal ends in L and you can make the face, right? Uh, or make an L. Yeah. I don't yeah. suggest doing that because people think you're calling them a loser. Yeah. So I always say, hey, are you married is a personal question. So this is the personal side. Yeah. Um, so then you just start looking at people again. So you were asking before, who would I talk to? Well, I know I need to start with her or her, right? Mm -hmm. Give them more time. He's also going to need a little more time to see how his eyebrows are high. Yep. Straighter. So I yep. know I can talk to them second. And then literally when I'm talking to him, you just change the pitch and I'll show you an even a more, a better example. So I was talking to an RV dealership and they said, families come in all the time. We don't know who to talk to first, the husband or the wife. I said, it doesn't matter about the sex of the person, but with what I taught you guys today, who would you start talking with? The wife. Right. And what would you talk to her about? Uh, what, you know, things that are, are, I guess, things that are important to like 
other people like what how she helps yeah. other people things hey, like that. who's who are you guys going to go visit when you get the rv right who's going to yeah. ride with you somebody coming with you on the rv for him he's got straight eyebrows i'm gonna get straight to the point what's my price cost. yeah price you name it so you just talk to the people differently but for her let's say that this is real estate for him what are you looking for a three three a two two what's your price range you're looking for for her oh is are you going to be entertaining at the house who are the extra bedrooms for so you just start looking people. Yeah. I actually think anyone who watches this presentation and listens to the podcast should actually go and create like 10 questions that you would probably ask if someone was, if, if you got on a call and you found out they were high eyebrow. So you actually have questions that you know how to go into, like whatever you're pitching, whatever you're selling, create 10 high eyebrow, rounded eyebrow, like questions, high eyebrow questions, 10 rounded eyebrow questions, and like 10, 10 lower, lower eyebrow questions and 10 angled eyebrow questions. Yeah. And you can even make the same 10 questions, but you just change where's the focus, mm -hmm. right? So again, selling a house, rounded eyebrow, who's going to come visit you? Who are the spare bedrooms for? Angled eyebrow. Oh, this is your house. What's your favorite room in a house? Is it the kitchen? What, what, what are you looking for? What's the most important feature of this house for you? If it's a straight eyebrow, what's your price range? What's your interest rate you're looking for? What's your square footage? It, okay. You know, you can take the same question. You just tailor it three different ways. Cool. All right. So uh, how are we doing on time? I'm, good. One, I'm, good? I'm good. Yeah, go for it. Okay. All right. So I want to teach everybody one more thing that I always look for, because this was the biggest one when I was doing presentations before. And this is kind of the bonus. And that is you can look at people and their eye angle will tell you how to talk to them as well. So we already talked about how much time you give them. What do you focus on? Do you focus on the other people, them, or do you get straight to the data and the facts? But people's eye angle will also tell you how to present information to them. So I mentioned before that I used to sell technology and it was to a pretty tough group of people that we sold the technology to. I would literally look and on their professional side, I would say, does it angle up? I talk about the features and benefits because they want to hear the upside. Does it angle down? Well, they're always expecting what's the worst thing that can happen. So you saw me as a kid, my eye used to angle down quite a bit. I could always tell you what could potentially go wrong. So if I'm talking to somebody, and let me show you the fancy uh, tool here that you use. Now, you don't do it to a live person, but if you're looking at somebody on LinkedIn, you take a business card, which I guess you can't see. Let me so turn around. Yep. Okay, that won't work. All right. I um, saw it when it was black, by the way. Oh, you did? Okay. Yep. So all you do is you put it up against the inside of their eye, and you go, does it angle up? So you go point to point. You go, does it angle up? They want to hear about the upside. Even is they'll listen to upside or the downside. Or is it angled down? And that is you talk about what uh, the downside is. So if it's angled up, then you talk about the features and the benefits. Even you can talk about whatever. If it's angled down, then you talk about, well, this isn't the first version of our product. This is what we learned in the first two prototypes that led us to create to perfecting the product that I'm showing you today. Because they want to know that you thought about all these things. So if you see somebody with a downward angle eye, some people go, oh, they're just so negative. No, they're just thinking in terms of, hey, there's potholes ahead. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Hmm. And that's one that I used to think, oh, well, here comes a negative Nancy. Well, I used to be one. And it wasn't that I was trying to be negative. That's just the way my brain worked was I thought, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So now I'll look and when we're talking about, again, if I'm talking about the features and benefits, I look over here for the person who's got the upward angle eye. And if I'm talking about, here's the problems we had, here's what we've learned through the history of our product, you know, the failures we had, I look at that person. So now I'm speaking everybody's language in the same presentation. And for How kinesthetic, did... oh, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. Finish. I was gonna say, here's my other secret trick. Whenever we were talking about, okay, well, once you start working with us, I would always have a long sleeve shirt on and I would roll up the sleeves because those are for the kinesthetic people. And when you're rolling up your sleeves, what are you rolling up your sleeves to do? Go to work. There you go. Oh, that's smart. I like that. <laughs> yeah. How how does like different ethnicities play a role? Because I, I different ethnicities affect like eyebrows, affect eye shapes, affect sure. a lot of different things. How how does that play into it? everything? Is in proportion to your face, right? And there are different ethnicities that have different facial features that are larger or smaller. Some eyelid, no eyelid. It's all in proportion to what can you see across a kind of a baseline. So everybody looks a little bit different. Everybody has a different ethnicity. And because of whatever region of the world they were born in, those facial features are different by a little bit. So it, if you know that it's a facial feature that is put with a particular ethnicity, 
then it's called a non-read. So not every feature has to be read. And actually, I'll show you that here in a second. Um, let me jump ahead a little. So when we look at something, we look at what's prominent about their individual face, or you can go with what's specific. So on specific ones, I like eyebrows, eye angle, and upper lip, because that tells me pretty much all I need to know about somebody to create that initial rapport. But you can also look at what's so prominent that if they went to a characterist to draw their face, would that person over-exaggerate? Does that make sense? Yeah, unfortunately for me, it's my nose, but yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got something. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's, we'll why, that's, why, that's, why, that's why I don't get uh, characters done of me. I'm like, this is, I'm too insecure to look at that big nose. But yeah. <laughs> look, mine, it's eyebrow and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So I used to have one that I used to show, but I don't remember where I put it. Um, so we'll wrap this up and then I'll, I'll yep. talk about something else here in a minute. But so I do the acronym FACE reading. So F-A-C-E find the feature, assess the meaning, convert it, and express it. So find, assess, convert, and express is an easy way to remember it. So look, it is face reading. I don't like calling it face reading up front because then people go, ooh, can you read palms? And no, yeah, yeah. can't. <laughs> so, and because it's been around since the Greeks, I know you can't see the book, but if you go and look at physiognomy, it used to be taught in schools. And then when it got thrown off with phrenology, the bumps on the head, well, it's still taught to some attorneys for jury consulting, and it still is taught in some places in the world, but really should be taught to everyone because we're losing the ability to build relationships with people. So uh, sorry, that was my tangent again, but oh, I like those it. are the steps. Find, assess, convert, and express. And if you don't like assess, and I spelled it wrong here, you can put analyze. That's another way because I call it facial analysis. But what you do is how do you first find the person? Well, like I did for you, I start with LinkedIn. Then I move to social media because LinkedIn is a more static picture and social media is more recent. But the important thing is using you as the example, your LinkedIn profile. Well, on one, I can see your head, but it's tilted. And the other one, the shadows there. So that's why I would then go find additional pictures. So what you ideally want when you're in the finding phase is a good picture is one that's straight on, one that's not angled one way or the other, and one that's well lit so you can see all the facial features. So once you find a few pictures like that, then you can start actually analyzing their face. Then we go to assess what does their feature mean or analyze it, right? And go, okay, angled eyebrow. Now, what was that again? Okay, angled eyebrows help them understand what's their angle. So then when you start doing that, then you turn around and you say, I know what I want to say. So now how do I convert what I would normally say so I'm speaking their language? So what do their eyebrows say? What do their eyes say? What do their lips say? And then I think, okay, now I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna speak their language. So then you go to express it and after you've translated it. And this is what you asked me about earlier. If I'm doing a business presentation, the chances are if it's going to one person, it's gonna to go to several people for approval. So even though talking, let's say that for you, and I, when I looked at the picture, you look like an equal balance of eye and ear. So for you, I'd say you're kind of a double threat, but some people like we saw the judges earlier, they're definitely more auditory. But if I don't know, then I add in the universal language. So I'll add in some visual phrases. Hey, if you can see where I'm coming from, picture this. Then I'll add in later, if this sounds like a good idea, or I'll say, if it hears like we're on the same page, or it sounds like we're on the same page, those are all auditory ones. And last but not least, then I'll say, I'll add in some kinesthetic phrases. Like, um, you know, if it's something you can really wrap your hand around, you know, if it feels like we're, we're moving in the right direction, those are kinesthetic mm. phrases. So you add those into your emails or your presentation because you don't know who the next person is. So if I write everything strictly for a visual person and it goes to an auditory person, they're not going to get it. I love this. Yeah. Very cool. I could talk about this stuff all day. It literally, it's the fun part about it is, it's not automatic. So it's, I'm sure you've read a book on body language. You don't constantly analyze body language, but it's a good thing to know when you want to use it to try and help, right? So for example, is somebody's arms crossed because they're cold or are their arms crossed and their shoulders are slumped and then there's something wrong? So it's just a tool to help under, people understand each other. And going from being an introvert that, it sounds like a sob story, it's not. But it sucked to be in public and not know how to be in public at the same time. And with this, because I'm focusing on just creating connection with other people and not making it about me, it changes the dynamic. Because nobody likes somebody who's needy 
but we all like people who are interested in us. And that's what this can help teach people. So um, what questions do you have? I mean, I'll, I'll leave this up for, for one more second, then I'll, I'll, I'll shut the screen share and then we'll, sure. we'll, we'll, we'll do it. But then, um, and then I'll put the, the notes up for everyone uh, yeah. where to find you. I mean, I, I think this was fascinating. I think we could go deeper, obviously. I think I'm going to have to come back and then we'll do, we'll do lips and the noses and ears after if, if you, if you really want, I think this is oh, a great, I think it's a great start. I think it's super important. I, I like the message behind it. Uh, before I even let the audience find out how they could work with you or, or how they can learn more, mm -hmm. I think an important question to ask is, okay, we've now shown how we could do this and look at it from an, from other people and how right. we could either make friends better, uh, become a bit more sociable, or even go as far as close more sales and, 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 learn, and learn how to close more deals. How should someone look at themselves in the mirror and look at their own features and, and analyze themselves and maybe use that? to an advantage. Sure. Um, I laughed because that's the first thing that you do when you learn how to read faces is you go and find a mirror and then you start covering up each side of your face because it's literally like getting to know yourself differently. Um, like we talked about earlier, if you go and you sit in front of a mirror and you realize that you have low straight eyebrows, then you realize, oh crap, I probably interrupt people a lot. So you start paying attention to what can you change a little bit. Now you wanna know who's masters of this? Women. And the reason why, and when I say this, it's not a bad thing. Makeup has been used to enhance facial features for a very, very long time. So for example, lipstick, before lip injections became the number one plastic surgery, which why? Because this is your personal lip. And if it's larger, people think that you're more approachable. That's why this it's done. So I mentioned earlier, the inverse of that is keep a stiff upper lip is literally saying that says, don't share your emotions. But that's why people are running out and getting their lips enhanced. Well, before you could do lip injections, what'd you have? Bright red lipstick. And there are women who would draw their lips larger than their lips actually were without knowing why. That's the reason why. So you can adjust certain things. Um, I tell guys all the time, if you have a beard like I do, you have to trim this area here so we can see your upper lip or we don't know how to interact with you. So if you have a, a very full beard, and I'm jealous of people who can grow the cool 300 beard and all that, I just tell them, no matter what, make sure that we can see your upper lip. But women will enhance their cheeks to make them look wider with rouge. We already talked about lipstick. When uh, people shave off their eyebrows, the first one they tend to draw back is an angled one. Nobody taught them what that means, but that's why they do an angled eyebrow because it's help involve me in the process. I want to be included, right? What's my angle? So is, is that because that's their innate nature or that's because like, that's how they want to be perceived? That's how they want to be perceived. So over time, what happens is the way that you act is how people start to treat you, right? So it's actually, it's kind of creating what you want and how you want to be interacted with. So I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, I don't know if I can Google it real fast. Have you ever seen the one where there was a baby and a guy drew three different eyebrows on his baby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same baby smiling, but you put angle eyebrow and it looks like an evil laugh versus a rounded eyebrow is like a, a fun laugh but it is if if you want to make these adjustments to your face or what does my face subconsciously tell other people about me and when i say subconsciously again because we've all been trained through books cartoons movies what does this feature mean like all witches have pointed chin a downturned nose angled features so if people think that you're too aggressive or too um yeah, too aggressive is probably a good term. Maybe don't make them quite as angled. Maybe try and round them out a little bit or don't enhance them for sure if that's one of your concerns. But don't, when you learn what your face says about you and you learn a little bit about yourself, you also give yourself grace. And then yeah, you don't, don't use the town to go change every part about you and be like, right. oh, okay, wow, so I'm low eyebrow. I gotta, I gotta shave my eyebrows yeah. and now draw like, I like uh, round eyebrows so everyone thinks I'm selfless. Right. Yeah. It's more about understanding what does your face say about you to others? And is that who you are? And the majority of the time it is, right? So I showed you, I was very vulnerable and showed the picture of my eyes used to angle really down. And I used to be the one who could figure out, oh, what's what else is going to go wrong? And when you start to expect those things, guess what? That's kind of what happens in life. And um, there is a great book called, um, gosh, I'm just I'm re-listening to it right now. So give me one second. Psycho Cybernetics by, yeah, by uh, yeah, um, uh, Maxwell, uh, 
Maltz. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great book. If you listen to that, he was a plastic surgeon who, even when he would alter somebody's face, if they didn't feel it, then they still saw the bad thing that had been physically removed from their face. Yeah, he that, that was the whole experiment where they showed the picture and there was and they still saw themselves the exact same way as before they had the surgery. Exactly. And so all it is, and because I was raised in the time of Dr. Seuss, I have all kinds of things that rhyme throughout the course, like the more lid you see, the more they think in terms of we. Yeah. But my, my favorite one right now is with the face comes grace. And that should be included in your own face. Of uh, What's your face say about you? You know, and that is, we don't always think of ourselves as a third person. And sometimes even just giving yourself good eye contact, um, a great book right now for anybody who's struggling, go get the high five habit by Mel Robbins, where the first thing you do every day, when you walk up to a mirror, is you give yourself a high five and you say something positive because most people see the mirror as a villain, right? There's something that we don't like. I, I've got a, a scar on one of my eyebrows that I got from jumping up and down as a kid. And I used to see that every time I looked in the mirror and I'm like, nobody else can see that, but me. You know, and that's where we're harsh on ourselves is in the mirror. Well, I, I've been married to my wife almost seven years and we've been together three years before that. And I remember just what was it, like half a year ago, I've, uh, she's like, what are you looking at in the mirror? And I'm like, can you notice this? Um, she's like, what? And then she saw it. She's like, oh, my God. Yeah. For, for 10 years, she's never noticed. And now when she looks at me in the mirror, she's like she like now when she like it's an inside joke. She's like, you're looking at it. Like She's like, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> but like for 10 years, never noticed my own it like. But that always goes to why I tell people put out content, why to do this. It's your own insecurities yep. are always louder in your own head and people don't see it the same way. Like, I, yeah, it, it's you the, gotta be comfortable with who you are. You do. And look, I'm 47. It took me a long time to get that way. I used to be so worried about who's paying attention to me. I wouldn't go out on a dance floor. I wouldn't do anything. And I still look, I still go in those introvert times. Um, I was at a, a seminar and I just sat in the back the whole time. I sat in the far back corner because I can people watch, makes me happy. Yeah. I'm still getting the info. And then I was just as shy as anybody else. So, well, hell, when I went to Brad's event, um, the very first person I met was Sam Taggart. And he's awesome. If you know who he is, he has a door-to-door in D to D con. Great guy. Teaches door knocking for solar roofing. Just a great human. Um, I went to House of Blues because they were going there after the first day of conference. I was flying in to speak the second day. And I got the house of blues. I'm like, great. I'll get here. Brad will introduce me to some people. Shit. Brad had already left. Sorry if I, if cussing is bad, but Sam just had this big smile. And I went over, I talked to Sam and Sam made me feel comfortable. Then I started talking to everybody else. But once you, it's almost like you still need that. And even for me where I can walk into places and it's weird when people know me, but I'm still an introvert at times. Now I'd love to be around people, but yes, it still happens to us all. But again, it, it's, learning to be comfortable with it's okay to be a little bit of everything it's okay to be an introvert it's okay to be an extrovert it's okay you know not to have perfect speech um it's okay not to have hair <laughs> you know i mean but you're right the scariest thing is putting content out there where you're the content everybody's been an employee who's been told how to push a product but to have that same belief in yourself as you do a product it's weird that it's that hard so, hey, amen for the people who want to learn more about this, they, they want to learn more from you. They want to work with you, whatever it is. How do they get in touch with you? Uh, everything is subtle skills. So S-U-B-T-L-E-S-K-I-L-L-S. -L -L -S. That's me on Instagram. Um, I locked down TikTok. I'm going to start putting videos there. I just haven't yet. That's my website, subtleskills.com. Uh, you Google me, you'll find all the same things. Love it. Appreciate it. Thank you for so much for doing this. And it's good to finally meet you. And uh, yeah. And yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the time, Jason. I appreciate it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you want, check out our most recent video over here. And this one is the one YouTube thinks you'll like. But if you really enjoyed watching, please do me a favor, like and subscribe over here. Thank you so much.